Uh, we are continuing our study this morning in the book of Acts, and we're covering just the tail end of chapter 2. And so uh, why don't you stand with me, open your Bible to Acts chapter 2. We'll read verses 40 through 47, and we'll pray. Acts 2 verse 40 says this, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, I do pray um, you would teach us according to the apostles' doctrine, which is your doctrine. I pray that we would be a church that values corporate worship, simple, humble praise, heartfelt prayer. And we pray that you would add daily to your church. We love them in this congregation, but whatever congregation you add them to, just add them. Grow your church, build your kingdom. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's been said that the South is the Bible Belt and Texas is the buckle. And if you drive around any town in Texas, and it doesn't matter how big or how small, you're going to find this. A lot of churches, you'll find First Assembly of God, First United Methodist, First Baptist, First Missionary Baptist, First Southern Baptist, First Primitive Baptist, and on and on and on. It's doubtful that you'll see a first Calvary chapel. Technically, we would be it here, but anything's possible. A town may not have a second Methodist or Assembly God or anything else, but they'll definitely have a first. And so we might say, well, what about, you know, instead of first, insert your denomination here, whatever denomination you want, instead of a first, what if there was just a first church? Not necessarily first Christian, that's actually a denominational name, but simply first church. Well, there's only one congregation in history that can truly claim the title, and that's the initial church in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. It was then that the church was born, so that's first church, right? First church at all of history. And as such, that church becomes a standard for every church. For a brief shining moment, the local church, lowercase c, was the church, uppercase c, right? And they did everything the way it ought to have been. Now, historically speaking, sadly, it didn't last long. Uh, The the gospel doesn't go outside the city of Jerusalem uh, before problems start developing. Uh, The book of Acts shows Christians being warned of false teachers. The Bible doesn't even end uh, without warnings in the book of Revelation given to church congregations that were already dead. Uh, The problems that we experience in modern churches today had their rise long ago, and Christians, we've been struggling with the same things throughout the ages, but for a time, things went right. When the first church congregation came about in Jerusalem, what they did is what every church in every city ought to do everywhere. Their love for God and their love for each other was evident to everyone around them, and it serves as an example for us today. Now, our text actually picks up at the tail end of a monumental event in history. Of course, that's the day of Pentecost. I got it back up just a little bit. Remember, it's only in can't ever forget how soon this was in relation to the resurrection. It was only 50 days after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. It was 10 days after his ascension to the right hand of God in heaven. And it was then that the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples just as Jesus had promised. 
And the moment, as we've seen in the past couple weeks, the moment of their spirit baptism was truly powerful. There was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. There were visible tongues of fire resting on the heads of the Christians. And then there's this spiritual gift of tongues that were spoken by the disciples as they praised God. And all of that activity attracted the attention of the Jews who had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And Peter took the opportunity to engage in the first open-air evangelistic sermon of the church age. So first, we saw Peter explain the tongues. And he showed that these things were prophesied, that their existence was evidence of the world entering the last days. So people needed to be prepared to face the judgment of God. And of course, secondly, in relation to that, the fact of the last days that people had an urgent need to be saved because they would be facing the judgment of God. And the only way they could be saved was through Jesus of Nazareth. Peter went on to show that God had testified of Jesus to Israel, demonstrating him to be the Messiah, the most effective proof of his deity coming after Israel's rejection of him. They had killed Jesus, but God had raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus' resurrection proved conclusively that he is both Lord and Christ. He is both God and King. So the only hope Israel had was if they repented and believed upon Jesus being baptized in his name. Individual Jews needed to make an individual commitment to Jesus as their Messiah, as their Christ, and receive the salvation that only God could give. Okay, so that's the essence of Peter's message as related, of course, by Luke. What was the response? What were the results to follow? That's what Luke records next. The day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost began with a spirit baptism. It began with a preaching of the gospel. And it ends with the birth of the church and the establishment of what every church ought to be, what every church ought to do. So what did the first church do? It ought to sound familiar. They loved God, they loved each other, and they loved the lost. It's exactly the same thing we ought to do today. So we'll start with the advent of the church, starting in verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Thank you. The first thing to notice is that Peter had more to say. He's the preacher, of course. And like any good preacher, he's not done with these few words that are written in our Bibles. You know, it takes only a few minutes uh, to read it all the way through. You know he preached longer than that. He had many other words. Luke gives us a, a you know, partial sermon, a summary. He doesn't give a, a full transcript. He gave us the essence of what it was Peter preached. Is of course, guided by the Holy Spirit. Luke was inspired by the Holy Spirit, just as Peter was when he preached it. This was a message filled with urgency. To say that Peter testified and exhorted them is to say that he gave them a solid declaration with authority pleading with them from the word of God. (laughs) This may have been Peter's very, very first sermon, but he preached it with passion and for good reason. There was an urgent need for people to be saved. Remember, he made the point that God's judgment was at hand and that he reminded the Jews that they would face God's judgment not only for their routine sins, quote-unquote, all of our sins we might think of routine, but they were specifically guilty of having sent Jesus to the cross. They, that city at that time, 50 days ago, had rejected and killed the Messiah, the Son of God. Everyone has an urgent need to be saved, uh, but the Jews of Jerusalem (laughs) needed it a lot. So what's Peter's exhortation? His exhortation is to be saved. I want to say the translation, if you're following along in the New King James, is correct, and it's shared by the Uh, New American Standard, Holman Christian Standard, be saved. Uh, If you're looking at King James, NIV, ESV, they get it wrong. They translate this as save yourselves. And I say this because the grammatical voice and and mood of the, the Greek is that of what's called a passive imperative, meaning that it's a command, it's an imperative, it's a command, but it's an action that needs to be received passively received and not something actively done and performed by us. And theologically, that makes a huge difference. We cannot save ourselves. We must be saved, right? There's not a single thing that you or I can do that can bring about or earn our own salvation. Faced with the judgment of God in the light of the myriad nature of our sins, there is nothing... (laughs) 
Zero, zilch, zip. Nothing that we can do to save ourselves. The only thing we can do is cry out for mercy in order that God in his grace might save us. Now that's exactly what he promises to do. Jesus said, come to me all you who are labor, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, I will give you rest. He promised that the Father's not gonna cast away anybody who comes to him in faith, in sincerity, in true humility. Nobody would be cast out. He promises to save, but it is his work to save. So we trust him. We give ourselves completely over to him. Now, from what were these people to be saved? They're to be saved from this perverse generation. The word perverse could be translated crooked. You'll actually recognize the term. Uh, the term in Greek is scolios, right? Scoliosis, a crooked spine, all right? That's where this comes from. Something that's perverse is crooked, it's corrupt, it's bent, it's dishonest, right? So this is a description of, of Peter's entire generation. Be saved from this crooked, this scoliosis generation. It's not limited to a single person, not limited to a single nation, from the entire generation, and it still is. Our generation is a perverse generation. And before we just point the fingers, we are our generation, can't look at other people in our generation, just blame it on other people. Those other people were us. At least, you know, apart from the transforming work and transformation, salvation of Jesus Christ. We are just as guilty as anyone else, and it's from that guilt we need to be saved. Be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved from your own crookedness, your own bentness away from God. Now, before we go any further, I've got to ask you, if you have been saved... Have you experienced Jesus' grace away from this crooked, perverse generation, or are you still a part of it, contributing to it? Be commanded, be saved. Receive the work of Jesus on your behalf. Verse 41, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. You've got to love that response. 3,000 people. As amazing as it is, when you watch the TV programs and you see you know, the old tapes, people, hundreds of people walking forward at Billy Graham Crusade, or you, you watch it today with Greg Laurie and his Harvest Festivals, hundreds of people walking forward, those events are nothing like the day of Pentecost. All due respect to the others, God uses them in marvelous ways, but Peter had no platinum award-winning bands backing him up. He had no choir led by, you know, Bev Shea singing Just As I Am. Didn't even have a sound system. He especially didn't have nearly 2,000 years of preparatory work done by others preaching the gospel before him. Praise God for those things. Use them. Peter didn't have them. Certainly the grace of God and the promise of the Messiah had been proclaimed since the Garden of Eden, but this was the very first occasion in all of history that the fully revealed news of Jesus Christ had ever been preached. This was the first time that the news was publicly stated of Jesus of Nazareth, who had been sent by God, died on the cross for our sins, risen from the grave, ascended to God in heaven, being the Son of God and King of the Jews. Never before had that ever been proclaimed, and people responded in droves by the thousands Peter would have been pleased if three came forward. 3,000 was absolutely amazing. But as wonderful as 3,000 was, it wasn't everyone. The whole crowd, however many there were, heard Peter's word, but notice not everyone received it. Anyone can hear the gospel, but it doesn't mean that everyone is saved. Anyone can show up to church or a revival crusade. Anyone can be a regular attender of a church, but attendance doesn't make anyone a Christian. Probably everyone in the Jerusalem crowd could have recited back the basic facts of what Peter had just spoken to them, but only a percentage, however big or small that was, of that crowd actually received the news for what it was. Okay, so what's the difference? What's involved with receiving the gospel rather than just hearing it is action. It's a response. The good news of Jesus is news that demands a response. Now, not all good news requires action. <laughs> You can hear that Walmart's having a sale on televisions. Good news if you happen to be in the market for one, but it doesn't demand an immediate response. You can hear that they're giving away TVs. Doesn't really make a difference in your life if you pick one up or not. It's good news, but it's irrelevant. The good news of Jesus is something else altogether. 
To miss out on Jesus is to miss out on eternity. To miss out on Jesus is to miss out on the forgiveness of God. It's to miss out on the abundant life that's available right now in the Holy Spirit. To miss out on Jesus is to miss out on everything. That news about Jesus Christ is news that demands a response. Action must be taken. And in this case, the action was very, very specific. It was baptism. Remember, the crowd was cut to the heart, verse 37. They're cut, stabbed to the heart with the news. Their conscience convicted them. The Spirit convicted them. And Peter told them that the right response was repentance and baptism, verse 38. They were to sincerely turn away from their sins, put their faith in Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness, the symbol of that faith being a public identification with them through baptism, immersion, baptism. And of course they did. 3,000 were immediately baptized, the event happening that day. Please recall from last week, baptism does not save. It's symbolic of the salvation that Jesus has already given. But that doesn't mean baptism is unimportant. By all means, believing Christians are to be baptized. We are commanded to be baptized as an ordinance given to the church by none other than our Lord Jesus, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, right? So it's not something to impose on an unknowing infant. It is commanded of those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you have not been baptized as a believing Christian, I implore you to please come talk to me. We can't do it this very day, but we will do it very, very soon, <laughs> I guarantee, okay? So with these 3,000 baptized, now added to the disciples, what just happened? Right here, this is the advent of the church. Now, already in Jerusalem, there were Christians earlier in the morning. You know, the church was truly born when the Christians were baptized by the Holy Spirit. But by the afternoon, all of that came to fruition with the first converts. We're only talking about a period of a couple hours here, right? By this addition of 3,000, the church had officially arrived. 3,000 people. We get impressed by that question. Does God care about numbers? 3,000 are mentioned here. Does the Bible keep membership records? Do numbers matter? Yes and no. Both are true. Yes, God cares about numbers. We got a book named Numbers. God cares about numbers because God cares about each individual who receives Christ. God knows us by name and individuals add up. Yes, God desires great multitudes of people to be saved. And there are times in the scriptures where numbers are recorded. There's times in the scriptures where the numbers are too big to count. Revelation 7 verse 9. So in that sense, yes, they do. But at the same time, no. God does not value one congregation over another based on the number of people in the pews. A home fellowship of a handful of people who are faithful to Jesus, faithful to the gospel, is of more worth than a megachurch that's preaching heresy. God is not impressed by numbers or budgets. God sees, seeks sincere faithfulness far more than nickels and noses. Right? We want to be faithful to the gospel. By the way, Speaking of these 3,000 converted, notice where all this massive response took place. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. For all the skeptics who claim that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a fraud or a myth, how do they explain the 3,000? Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, was the one place above any other place in all the world that would have been able to expose a fraud if one had existed. Peter was most likely preaching right outside the temple gate, and any one of the people there could have taken a short walk to the tomb of Christ and pointed out his decaying body if it had been there. Many of them had probably been witnesses to Jesus' crucifixion, maybe even personally calling out for it from the mob. They would have watched him die, yet not a soul raised a voice in opposition, and 3,000 people agreed with Peter that Jesus Christ had, in fact, risen from the dead, proven as their Messiah. This was no fraud. This was and is gospel truth. So there's the advent of the church. What's the activity of the church? Starting in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. So with the arrival of the church described, what was it that the church did? Verse 42 provides a summary by the way, showing that whatever it was, it was done with intention. This word that's used for continued steadfastly has the general idea of continuing to do something with intense effort. 
the, the term is actually based in another root word that means might or power or strength. So it's intentional. In other words, the things that Luke lists are not things that were considered by the church to be minor. They weren't afterthoughts. They weren't to be done with minimal effort. No, these were the primary goals of the church as they sought to glorify God. They did them with intention. They did them with purpose. Okay, what were they? Four categories. Number one, teaching. Teaching listed first is the church's devotion to doctrine, specifically the doctrine or the teaching of the 12 apostles. And what was it that the apostles taught? Obviously, we don't have transcripts of their individual studies, but the Holy Spirit preserved the essence of their teachings in the pages of the New Testament. Understand that at the time, the only Bible the church held in their hands was the Hebrew Bible. The Old Testament is seen in the Law of Moses, the history of Israel, the wisdom, the poetic teachings, the prophets. And there's zero doubt that the apostles taught from those scriptures because those scriptures point to Jesus, Jesus himself provided examples of those things on the day of his resurrection, on the walk to Emmaus, Luke 24, verse 27. But the New Testament, as we know it, had not yet been written, so the church also relied on the recollection of the apostles, right, from their time spent with Jesus. And for the church to hear the memories of the apostles, that's like us reading the pages of our four Gospels. The apostles taught others what Jesus had taught them. The apostles taught others the things that they had experienced under his leadership, watching his miracles. All the the parables, perhaps, we didn't even hear in the Gospels. They were able to uh, relate back to them. This is something that Jesus specifically told the apostles they'd be empowered to do once the Holy Spirit came upon them. John 14, 26, he'll bring to mind all these things that I taught you. So they were able to do that. Jesus prepared the apostles to teach the newborn church and to teach it accurately. And guys, this is one reason we put such a high emphasis on Bible study, giving it a primary place in our worship gatherings. Because this book contains the doctrine of the apostles, which is in turn the doctrine of God. It contains all we need to know of the person of God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaches us what he wants us to do. Paul wrote to Timothy, as we've quoted many times before, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you want to be complete? Do you want to know what God has for you? Well, receive doctrine. And not just any doctrine, not just any teaching, but right teaching. It's easy to get carried away by charismatic personalities and exciting speakers. How do we know if anything of what they're saying is correct? Compare it to the written word of God. This is the assured true doctrine of God. That's how we continue in the apostles' doctrine. That's how we remain true to God's own teaching. So they were first gathered or or dedicated to uh, teaching. Secondly, they're dedicated to gathering. The term used for fellowship is a general term. It, It might summarize the next two items, actually. But the interesting thing about the word is actually unlisted in the New King James New American Standard, but the NIV ESV, they pick it up. It's the definite article here. Technically, this should be translated They continued steadfastly in the fellowship. Not just fellowship, but the fellowship. That implies something more formal, something more specific. The Greek term just refers to commonality or association. You may be familiar with it, koinonia, your koinonia fellowship. Well, that's the term used here. But Luke seems to have a formal gathering in mind. For the Christians, it was common for them to meet from house to house. We'll see that in verse 46. But that wasn't the only way that they met. They came together for worship. They came to regularly listen to the apostles. They participated in planned time together. All right, regular planned times of gatherings for the church are important. There is a reason why you know, we gather together on Sundays and Wednesdays, not just because it's tradition, because the early church gathered together on a regular basis. Now, we don't know their exact schedules, we know they gathered on Sundays, by the way, but we don't know if it was 10 a.m., 10.30, 9, whatever. It doesn't matter, right? Their schedule's different from ours. But they gathered, and they planned to gather. How else was the church supposed to receive the doctrine of the apostles if they didn't ever gather together to hear it? How was the church expected to love one another if they didn't get around one another to show it, know what the needs of one another were? 
Christ never intended Christians to live their lives separated from one another. We are his body, so we need to be around other Christians if we're going to be around other body parts. And I want to say this very gently, but beloved, it seems that too often Christians treat worship gatherings as optional. Something that's fine to go to when it's convenient, but it's the first thing to be set aside if something more exciting comes along. And it shouldn't be that way. By no means should worship gatherings become legalistic, but they ought to be prioritized. It was that way with the early church. All right, so doctrine, fellowship, worship. Now, the exact nature of the breaking of bread is debated, but it seems to be something of a, a more specific description of what he mentioned here when he's talking about the formal fellowship. Most agree that it's at least in part a reference to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we recall that in the earliest days of the church, the celebration of communion was intertwined with what was called a love feast, an ancient potluck where the church shared a meal together. It was their munchin' luncheon, right? We have a munchin' luncheon every month. Well, they did as well. They had this ancient potluck. For, for some members of the congregation, you know, some of them came from very poor backgrounds. It may have been the only meal that they ate all day long, which kind of opened the door for all kinds of uh, abuse and selfishness and, and, and gluttony. And Paul addresses some of that, has to bring correction to the church, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty through 22. But when it was done rightly, it was wonderful. Uh, they, they shared a meal with one another before they shared communion with one another. Culturally speaking, to break bread with someone was itself an act of fellowship and intimacy because you share meals as more than just an excuse for gathering. You know, it's sharing life. It's sharing sustenance. It's symbolic of how they're unified together. The same bread that's a part of you is a part of me, that sort of thing. And this made the love feast a perfect complement to the Lord's Supper. After all, what is it that we celebrate in communion what we have in common, koinonia. It's the gift and the body and the blood of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the Lord's Supper isn't included in all of our worship services. We'll celebrate today. We actually celebrate it twice a month, first Sunday and the third Wednesday. But the celebration of the Supper is supposed to be an act of worship. It's to be taken with sincerity, praise, and thanks. It's never to be done as a ritual, never to be done to earn favor with God. And it's to be done regularly. Some churches I know of celebrate it once a year. Now, the Bible never says how often we're supposed to partake, but it does use the word often in describing how we are to partake. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. Beyond the, the specific act of communion here when it comes to breaking of bread is this general idea of worship when the church comes together for gathering we're coming together for worship it's not a concert it's not a rally it's a time to intentionally put our attention on the lord jesus giving glory to god in other words it's a time that we come to actively participate you don't watch someone else break bread you do it Worship isn't a spectator activity, it's personal involvement. So you've got doctrine, you've got fellowship, you've got breaking of bread, then you've got prayer. That the church continued steadfastly in prayers it may seem to state the obvious, but it makes the point that prayer was emphasized in the early church. Technically, like I said, the fellowship, this should be translated, they continued in the prayers. Right? Perhaps there were some formal prayers, or maybe it's talking about there were some specific gatherings dedicated to nothing but prayer. But to the early church, prayer wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something to you know, sprinkle occasionally into a gathering. It was absolutely essential to the Christian life. Prayer was when they spoke to God, and they expected God to speak back to them. The church, you know, they were brought up and, and built up by the Lord Jesus Christ, and prayer was how they spoke to their Lord and King, and none of that has changed. Prayer is still how we speak to God, and it needs to be prioritized in the life of all church congregations, prioritized in the life of this congregation. Prayer is a far more important activity than we sometimes make of it. Sometimes we get the idea that you know, if we just say a couple of sentences in prayer at the beginning of a service, and a couple of sentences at the end, you know, we've kind of done our duty and that's enough. It's kind of like, you know, when you say the, the quick little, uh, thank you, Lord, for our food, amen, and just be done with it. And we just kind of went through the ritual. 
you know, that's a good start, but, you know, that can be considered kind of like a little bit of seasoning. Just a little, you know, parsley you drop on top. No, a lot of times prayer is supposed to be the meal, not the, the seasoning. Christians sometimes wonder where power has gone in the modern church. Now, why doesn't the church today look like the church of Acts? Maybe the answer could be found in this last description. We don't pray like the early church of the book of Acts. What was it that the Christians did when Jesus ascended? They continued in one accord in prayers and supplications, verse 14 of chapter 1. What was it they were most likely doing earlier on the morning of Pentecost when they had gathered and they were waiting for the Holy Spirit while they were praying? What was it that they did later on? If you know the book of Acts, Peter and John, when they were released from their arrest from the Sanhedrin, they prayed, chapter 4. Prayer was essential to the early church. It ought to be essential to us. And guys, when it comes to prayer, we have no lack of opportunities. We just have a lack of desire. How is it that you solve a lack of desire to pray? How else? You solve it by praying. When you lack the desire to pray, ask that God will give you the heart to pray. I guarantee you, he'll answer that. You've got four things here that comprise the main activities of the church. There were other actions as well. Miracles were done. We see it in verse 43. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. You say, well, wonders and signs sound wonderful. Why did the people fear? Oh, why not? If you saw daily demonstrations of the miraculous power of God done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you might fear too. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9.10. And these wonders and signs cause people to see and to understand the person and the power of God. We'll read about some of those in Acts chapter 5, and it really does cause the church to fear. By the way, what, should, what did take place among the early church should have taken place every day among the children of Israel during their wilderness wanderings. Because what did they see? They see, saw daily demonstrations of supernatural power. They saw the manna every day. They saw the cloud, the fire every day. You know, when they were at the base of Mount Sinai, they saw the glory of God sitting on top of the mountain. Every day should have been a day when they had a healthy fear of their God, but instead they took it for granted. That's when they got into trouble. By the way, we see somewhat of the, a similar thing today. What's one proof we know that the supposed miracles we see by the TV preachers are false? Because there's a complete lack of the fear of God. Yeah. The miracles on TV, you see, are lifted up for miracles' sake. They're done to you know, elevate the profile of the preacher, not to proclaim the gospel. If they feared the Lord, they wouldn't be treating the Lord like a circus. When God truly acts in power, there's no way anyone would dare treat him lightly or any other way except through healthy fear. And that's what happened here. By the way, it begs the question, if miracles happened as they did, we'll see throughout the book of Acts, if miracles happened often in the early church, then are signs and wonders necessary for a local congregation to be considered a true church today? No. Now, I'll say that's a qualified no. I'll get to the qualification in a minute, but no. In these initial signs and wonders were what? In the text here, done through the apostles. Through the apostles for establishing the 12 apostles of Jesus as foundational and authoritative within the church. Ephesians 2, verse 20, Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but the church is built upon the apostles, Okay. So it establishes them as authoritative. And considering that those 12 men are long dead, the context then for those signs and wonders has long changed. The one qualification, though, is this. Conversion. Please remember that conversion is a miraculous, supernatural event. Miracles are not limited to healing the sick. Miracles are not limited to walking on water. Every single time a person is saved, a miracle has been done. Because somebody just went from death to life. So with that in mind, we do expect miracles in the modern church because we expect people to get saved. So we expect God to interact with his people, for him to answer prayers, for hearts to be changed. Those things are supernatural. And so all of those things ought to keep within us a healthy fear of the Lord. Verse 44, now all who believe were together together they had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. No one lacked anything. Why? Because everyone loved. The love that the church had for one another was practical, and the result was that needs were met as those needs happened to arise. The whole idea here is one of family 
community. And if you think about it, when your family needs help, what do you do? You help. Whatever the need, you do what it takes to meet the need. If your kid needs braces, then what do you do? You rearrange your budget to try to find a way to get your kid in braces. If your parents have a medical emergency, you drop what you're doing, go help your, your folks. That's the sort of thing that's described here of these early Christians. They treated one another like family. They saw one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, and they made their decisions accordingly. If that meant some land needed to be sold in order for these widows over here to have something to eat, well, they'll gladly do it. If that meant that one of their possessions that they had could be sold so that somebody else could survive, then they gladly gave it. They had the proper understanding that everything on earth is fleeting. All possessions are ultimately temporary. Can't take it with you anyway, so you might as well hold on to it loosely in the present. If God can be glorified through the gifts of our possessions and finances, then so be it. Sell it all. That means God is going to be glorified and the name of Jesus can be known. He does raise an objection. Because this is an idea that can become ripe for abuse. What about those who would take advantage of the generosity of others? Because it is not right for a person who has labored hard for his or her things to give them all away to a person who hasn't labored at all. Why should a lazy person benefit off the labor of those more responsible? And the answer, biblically speaking, is they shouldn't. The loving generosity of the church is nowhere held as a mandate for communism, Nowhere held is a mandate for forced redistribution of wealth. Two things we can see here. Number one is all this was voluntary. Acts 5, we'll see, has the example of Ananias and Sapphira. Sapphira. They attempted to appear more generous than what they actually were, and they were struck dead. But the crime wasn't that they hadn't given it all. The crime was that they lied to God. Peter affirmed that as long as they had the money, they could do whatever they wanted. It was their money. Right? What they didn't have the right to do was lie to the Holy Spirit. The second thing is that the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, commands us to take responsibility for ourselves and to work hard for our daily provisions. Again, you think back to the manna provided by God in the wilderness. People still had to get up and go gather it for themselves. God put it out in the fields, but he didn't put it in their laps. When landowners were commanded to leave some fruit on the vines for the poor to go in and glean, the poor were expected to actually go in and glean it. The landowners just didn't give it to them. Laziness is universally condemned in the scriptures, and it carries over to the New Testament commands to the church. We read this from Paul to the Thessalonians, first, second Thessalonians, rather, two, three, verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Why well, is that? Because someone unwilling to work has a bigger problem than an empty belly. They lack self-discipline. Now, please note, there is a difference between unwilling and unable. Those unable to work need the compassion of the church. Those unwilling to work need the discipline of the church. The bottom line is that in Jerusalem, the church did not engage in government-mandated wealth redistribution. The apostles did not apply pressure and guilt to force landowners to give away all their possessions. What did happen is that Christians were so impacted by the love of God for them that they couldn't help showing that same love towards others. Jesus loved sacrificially. His people should love sacrificially. The takeaway is that when God-honoring churches love one another, we do so like family. The idea here is one of love, not an economic model. Now, please note this. Be careful not to read this text or any other like it, looking for excuses not to give sacrificially, right? We want to read the scripture within its proper context, but we want to be careful not to exempt ourselves from the principle. There may be some way that God's put on your heart where you can love a specific Christian family that he's putting on your mind and your heart. You can love them as family. There may be a real way that you can show a practical demonstration of the sacrificial love of Christ this afternoon to somebody. God, what is it that you would have me to do so your love would spill over my lives? You need to go do that. Ask God to show it to you. All right, so we talked about the actions of the church. Let's look briefly at the attitudes of the church. So continuing daily, verse 46, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, 
praising God and having favor with all the people. So there were intentional actions, there were intentional attitudes. Note this word in verse 46 and continuing. It's the same word that was used in verse 42. Continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and all the rest is used here in verse 46 to describe their attitudes as they engage these things. Exact same word. They didn't wait to be ruled by their emotions. They purposed with intention to live their days in ways that would honor God. And the first is through their unity. They were in one accord, having the same unified purpose as what was described as those prayers of chapter 1, verse 14. One accord. This was their one passion, their one will. We talked about that word before, that homothumadon. One passion, same will. They were united together by the Holy Spirit. So they don't come with their own agendas. They wanted the will of God for them. So whether that's in the temple and public, whether that's in house to house and private, their focus was not on themselves. It was always on the Lord Jesus. They're wondering every day as they get up, what is it, God, that you have for me? What's the best way that I could demonstrate your love to one another? What's the best way I can demonstrate my love for you? That is what kept them unified. They're not out there building any individual kingdom building any individual reputation or out about building the kingdom of God. All right, well, that takes us also to the second attitude. Not only are they unified, they're humble. Humility. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They're joyful. They're humble. Again, when the church's purpose is about the glory and the love of God, then there's no place for individual egos to get in the way. Early church, they don't wake up every day wondering how they can impress one another. They just wanted to worship Jesus with one another. Imagine going to church without all of the drama, without wondering about what people are going to think about the way your kids are dressed, how you could get them out the door that day. Or fearing that you might let on that you don't have everything quite all together when you show up. Imagine simple humility, love, and worship. That was the attitude of this church. They loved Jesus. They loved each other. There wasn't judgment. There were no strings attached. My prayer is we would be able to say the same thing here. So you have their unity. You have their humility. Third is their praise. Not only are they sincere and humble among one another, they're sincere in their praise of God. They're open in the testimonies they shared of him, quick to give him credit and glory. The word Luke uses for praise is to mention, to tell, to esteem. The idea is that praise is public. Now, there's no doubt that they worshiped him privately, but they were also quick to speak of Jesus publicly. When attention was given, they didn't put it back on themselves. They didn't put it on the apostles. They wanted the attention on Jesus. He was to get all the credit for all the signs and the wonders. We'll see that in chapter 4. Peter says, why are you looking at me like I did something here, you know, helping this man to walk? It was Jesus who did it. They're never taking credit for themselves. They're always giving it back to Jesus. They're giving praise to Jesus. They're esteeming him. He was to get the glory for all the possessions that were sold and given to the church. It wasn't about how much Barnabas gave. It wasn't about how much Ananias Sapphire gave. It was about Jesus, what he was doing. Their desire was for God to be praised, for God to get the glory. And again, this requires a removal of our ego. It's impossible to praise God when we're the ones hogging the spotlight. Now we get out of the way. Let the light shine on the cross. Don't even look at the worship team. Praise God. And so what's the results of all these actions and attitudes? Well, the church had favor with all the people. When the crowd saw the sincere love that the church had toward God, when they witnessed the practical and sincere love that the church had with one another, they could not help but take notice. The love of Christ will always be a testimony to Christ. Exactly as Jesus said it would be. Do you remember this? Whoops, John 13, verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The world doesn't know that we're Christians because we meet in church buildings. Especially this one, since we don't have a steeple out front. (laughs) They don't know that we're Christians based on our bumper stickers. They don't know that we're Christians based on our vote. They will know we are Christians based on our love. When the world witnesses Christians acting like Christ, they will see the sacrificial love of Jesus. What does all this lead to? Well, it leads to evangelism. At the end of verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
But the first result is that they saw, had favor of the people. Well, praise God for that. The second result is better. It's salvations. The culture saw the loving witness of the church, and people got saved. Now, it doesn't always work this way. Some in our culture and some in their culture, you know, they're bound to reject the love of God through Jesus. Jesus said they would. They, you know, he said, if the world hates you, it's because they hated me first, John 15, 18 and 19. But there will be some who believe. The love of God is a powerful force. When people see it in action, according to God's truth, then some people will be saved. And please note, just as we started today, salvation is God's work. Be saved, Peter said. And here it said, the Lord added to the church. The Lord is the one who did it. Now, no doubt the church was out there faithfully preaching the gospel. Peter had just done it earlier on Pentecost Day, but it wasn't the church who saved anybody. It was God himself who added to the church. Conversion cannot be forced. It can't be sold. You can't close the deal on somebody praying the sinner's prayer. It can't be maneuvered upon people. If somebody doesn't have salvation given to them by God, if God does not save someone, then that someone isn't saved. But God does invite everyone to be saved. No one is restricted from hearing the gospel. None are turned away who would respond. So for all of the churches and all the towns and all the world, first church of Jerusalem, that was wonderful. The earliest Christians set an example for all of us. They were birthed through a work of God in evangelism. They were dedicated to biblical teaching, purposeful fellowship, worship, and prayer. They treated one another like family. They lived their lives in unity, humility, and joyful praise as they're sharing the gospel with everybody. In short, they loved God. They loved each other. They loved the lost. Their love for God spilled over for one another, and they couldn't help but share the good news of Jesus with everyone around them. And what they were, guys, we want to be. Not that they did everything right. Not that they didn't make mistakes. They were human just like us, and they eventually needed correction just like we do. But for a time, they aced it. They set an example for every church to come. So what do we do with that? Well, we stay in that example. Don't depart from the foundation laid down at the beginning. Just as the church in Jerusalem dedicated themselves to godly activities and godly attitudes, so ought we. Just as the church in Jerusalem depended on on the Lord to add to their numbers, so do we. Churches today, we don't need to try to gin up crowds. We don't need gimmicks or light shows or circus atmospheres. What we need is Jesus. We need to love God as he's revealed himself to be. We need to love others like family in the body of Christ. We need to love the world enough to share the gospel, the good news with them, and God will do the rest. God will add to his church as he sees fit. We can trust him to do it. And that's us as a whole congregation. I hope that's true for all of us as a whole. But what do we do as individuals? <laughs> the exact same thing. Be dedicated to the same things that the early church was. Stay in doctrine. Don't neglect gathering. Don't neglect prayer. Don't neglect worship. Love one another in practical ways. Seek God's kingdom and not our own. What was said of the original Christians in Jerusalem could easily be said of us. We just need to do the same things. Now, as we close, you may be here among the church, but not actually part of the church. There was a percentage of the crowd in Jerusalem who responded that day. Not everybody. Statistically speaking, the same things here. Going to church isn't a matter of going through a class. Joining a church isn't a matter of signing a membership card. In fact, there's no biblical precedent for a membership card in Scripture. That's why we don't do it here. Joining the church is a matter of being saved. It's to receive Jesus as your God and King, receive his work for the forgiveness of your sins, and be born again by the Spirit of God. You can be saved today. Walked in here and you didn't have any relationship with God, you could walk out here being his child, totally forgiven. And you've got the opportunity to do that right now as we close in prayer. <laughs> Father, I thank you so very much for sending Jesus for us. And you gave Jesus for the world that we might have a Savior. We have sinned, so many sins that need to be forgiven. And Jesus paid the price for each and every one. There is no person who cannot be forgiven through Jesus Christ.
All that's required is simple repentance and faith. And so, Lord, I pray that you would draw those who need to respond today and help them make that commitment to you. Lord, for the rest of us who are gathered here as born-again believers, help us go forth in the same example as how the church began. Help us, Lord, not depart from this foundation, but empower us to love you like we need to, to love each other as we need to, and to love the world, the lost, by sharing the good news of Jesus with them. Help us be your church, empowered by your spirit, doing the things you would have us to do for your kingdom and your glory alone, that you would receive all the glory, Lord. We thank you so much. We're going to... uh...